welcome. So, I have some pretty shocking news to tell you. I'm Jewish! That's right. My father is Jewish. My mother is Jewish. My mother's parents, both Jewish. My father's mother was Jewish. My father's father actually comes from a very special set of Judaism that we like to call Super Jew. Uh, my mother's grandparents on both sides, Jewish. My father's mother's parents were communists. But you know, Jewish. there's actually no one in my entire lineage, genealogy tree, dating back forever and ever, that is not Jewish. And I think I may actually be cousins with Moses. So given this little bit of information, it may sound shocking to you to know that my immediate family celebrates Christmas. We always have, even way before I was born. And just so you are 100% clear on all of this, neither one of my parents ever celebrated Christmas before getting married and having children. And by some bizarre combination of their genes, <laughs> they deemed it appropriate to celebrate a pretty religious Catholic holiday uh, that neither one of them believed in at all. Why do we celebrate Christmas? I don't know. So I called up my mom and I asked her why why did we start celebrating Christmas? And she said, why not? I don't, I don't know. know. It just seemed like more fun. <laughs> <laughs> genuinely thought they were joking. <laughs> Not a good way to start a marriage. <laughs> I don't really have very many memories of them hugging or kissing or acknowledging each other, sitting on the couch next to each other, or anything at all. Um, they mostly spoke in cold shoulders and they developed a language over the years that can only be described as plate throwing. <laughs> I should mention that my mom is a manic depressive and she sort of gobbles up pills. And my dad just kind of like to drink that fact away. So it's good times at the Canaan household. <laughs> but at Christmas, it was completely different. It was like they were this different couple. They were happy and they smiled and they conversed about Christmassy things. and. And my mom would do this crazy thing where she would go into the kitchen and put food items in a, like pans and then turn the heat on and it would turn into a meal. <laughs> my dad would not, no, he'd still drink, but it wasn't like his usual like brooding Hemingway drunk. Around Christmas time, he was like this party time, like weekend at Bernie's drunk. And it was like, wonderful. And, and it was like this, one day out of the year, we were a regular family. And I absolutely loved it. And I wasn't the only one who loved it. Um, for the first eight years of my life, it was my sister Sarah and my sister Rachel and me, um, my two older sisters. And eventually, we had a little sister Ellie show up. And I would say for the first 10 years of my life, Christmas was a pretty magical time. Um, my dad had a pretty good job for a while, and we would just wake up on Christmas morning to like just 
toys, so many toys. There were Barbie dolls and Raptor sets and Cabbage Patch Kids and My Little Ponies and Pound Puppies and Shiras and Light Brights and Nintendos and Munchie Cheese and Speaking Spells and Trolls and the occasional necessity and easy to make ovens. I mean, you name it, we got it. Christmas morning was spent like, sneaking down the stairs at 4.30 or like some ungodly hour and just like staring at our loot. <laughs> and then after a while we deemed it appropriate to wake up my parents at like probably five in the morning and we come out just like disheveled and angry looking. And the first thing my mom would say every single year was, well, sh so should we open our presents or should we do our chores? <laughs> we always said, oh yeah, yeah, let's do chores. I mean, we probably need to mow the lawn. Like it's Christmas morning, we're eight, we're gonna mow the freaking lawn. And we would just start crying, like hysterical, and thinking that we'd have to wait to open presents. And my parents would just laugh and laugh. And for two people that really didn't like each other at all, the one thing they had in common was finding humor and torturing their children. <laughs> yeah, Christmas was a wonderful time for us. Um, it was like the one day out of the year that we felt like, like a real family. And now, okay, I know what you're saying. So why couldn't you be a real family and celebrate Hanukkah? I mean, you're Jewish, right? And I'll tell you why. There's a really good reason. And it's because Hanukkah is weird. <laughs> I don't know. I know the story of Hanukkah, because this is Texas, right? So here's a brief story of Hanukkah for you.
charge my phone, and I think it's only going to last 24 hours, and then it lasts a solid 36. And I've even been known to say, wow, that was a miracle. <laughs> what does any of this have to do with gambling for chocolate? <laughs> At what point did presents, and of course, when I say presents, I mean socks and other useful items, <laughs> become part of the holiday and why? And the last reason why I think Hanukkah is love. There are like five spellings of the word. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and so if Hanukkah doesn't make sense, well then Christmas, that must be completely logical, right? I only have came up with three reasons why. Number one, Santa's awesome and he knows magic. <laughs> Number two, unlike the whole miracle oil thing, a man traveling the world in a sled led by flying reindeer, sliding down the chimney of every child and delivering presents all in the course of one evening? That sounds pretty doable to me. <laughs> and the third reason why Christmas is totally logical, there's only one spelling of the word Christmas. <laughs> Unless you count Xmas, but that's like for convenience factor, I think, and then like, thanks for that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, as Jewish as my family was, and I should mention, we grew up in a pretty Jewish neighborhood. I never envied my Hebrew counterparts for their eight days of family present time. In fact, I felt pretty bad for them. I mean, my family took part in an American holiday tradition, <laughs> inescapable at shopping malls and, and on television. I mean, we weren't just allowed to watch claymation cartoons in my house, we were encouraged to watch them. There are no good Hanukkah cartoons at all. <laughs> Celebrating Christmas made my family just like everybody else. And that is all that I have ever wanted to be. I should mention, we kind of celebrated Hanukkah a little bit. And my grandparents were into it, and we would we'd get the menorah out at my house, and we'd light like for the first day or the second day, and then we'd just kind of forget it. It would be like the seventh day, not forget it. Or like we'd get it out, and then nobody cleaned out the, like, the candle crack from the year before. <laughs> my mom often made latkes around Hanukkah, which is a very traditional Hanukkah meal, but they always looked like this gray green color which I didn't understand why and I found that pretty disgusting and kind of unholy and so Hanukkah just sort of was started and ended. Um, in 1987 we got the best Christmas present ever a couple months later in my little sister Ellie. Um, I know that they say that, that couples sometimes have a baby to get their marriage back on track. And if that's what my parents were thinking, then, yeah, that just did not work. <laughs> it was the opposite of working, actually, which is not working. Uh, the following year, my dad lost his job, and my mom started to kind of get pretty crazy. And by the Christmas of 1989, my dad had moved out. Um, the first year without him at Christmas was pretty sad. We didn't have any money. And my mom was working at Caldor at the time. I don't know if you remember Caldor. And all of our Christmas presents were very Caldor-esque. <laughs> and she swore that Santa brought them to us, but I guess he forgot to take the security tags off of everything. <laughs> She didn't keep that job for very long. <laughs> I think out of all of my family members, my sister Sarah was the most addicted to Christmas. She, she loved Christmas. I mean, even as we got older, you know, it sort of takes on a new meeting. You have school vacations and you get sleep in late and you sneak beer, whatever it is. Sarah would still, 16, 17, she'd wake us up at like five in the morning to rush downstairs to look at like the three presents that were sitting there. And 
at some point we decided that our kid sister Ellie was the one who deserved a good Christmas and so we, so we really dedicated it to her. And Sarah would do these crazy things like she would wrap up presents for Ellie and then scratch them all up and then sign them for Rudolph and then she would say, oh Ellie, look, Rudolph can't wrap presents very well because of his <laughs> lack of opposable thumb. <laughs> In 1994, my mother married a guy named Frank who was 20 years her junior. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and Christmas took on some new meanings, which were like ziti dinners because he was very Italian, and Dominic, the Italian Christmas donkey. <laughs> again for a while with him not around. Um, let me go off on a tangent for a minute. <laughs> In addition to jolly old Saint Nick and, and Christmas miracles, my family has always believed in the power of prescription pills and self-medication. There's not one person in my family that hasn't sort of led a crutch on something at some point. This will all make sense in a little while. Um, I moved out of my mom's house just about as fast as I could. I left behind my little sister Ellie and my older <coughs> sister Sarah. My eldest sister Rachel was long gone. And Ellie made sense, you know, she was a little kid, but I never understood why Sarah didn't want to leave my mom's house. Um, even with like a nice, less drunk husband, my mom sort of started to lose it. And in 2002, I didn't go home for Christmas for the first time. I decided I was gonna go to my best friend's house because they had a turkey, and they had mashed potatoes and pie, and that just seems very, very more Christmassy and American to me. My mom's house was like crazy town at that point. She had started obsessively dyeing her hair, and then it was like, it would break off, because that's what happens when you dye your hair too much. And I guess she was like, whatever, and started shaving her head. And so she was bald. <laughs> Um, but I think she liked it a lot because people thought that she had cancer. Ooh. And <laughs> when they think that you have cancer. In 2007, my boyfriend and I picked up our stuff and we headed out and moved to Houston, Texas. That was about as far as away from my mom as I could possibly get, I thought, without getting, you know, being too, too far. But I obviously was not coming home for Christmas that year. And it was nice and refreshing and kind of liberating. And, and my mom was just sort of spiraling. And that year she went to the hospital a couple times. She thought she was having heart attacks, but she was having panic attacks. And I would have felt really bad to not have gone home, but my sister Sarah was still there, and it felt like, you know, a relief. The following Christmas, we did go home, uh, back to New York, and now we were engaged. And our parents were to meet for the very first time, which was so, 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 so stressful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> my husband's family is lovely. They do things like they take pictures in front of the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center, and then they print the pictures out, and then they put them in frames. It's like crazy. <laughs> they always have like this big Christmas Eve dinner and they play Secret Santa and somebody inevitably makes one of those green bean casseroles, which I personally find disgusting, but that is some Christmas tradition shit. <laughs> Meanwhile, my family was like, from another planet, 
But my oldest sister, Rachel, had long given up on Christmas. She married a Jew, and now all she did was celebrate Hanukkah, which I don't need to remind you is weird. <laughs> my mom is bald, and she's like popping Xanax. My mother is married to a man who's 20 years younger than her, and he thinks fart jokes are still funny. And then there's my sister, Sarah, who's 30 years old, and she never left her mom's house. So our family dinner um, meeting at Olive Garden is going to be awesome. <laughs> I should mention, I thought that I could kind of save Christmas that year. I thought I could perform my own Christmas miracle. Um, so I bought all the members of my family coordinated matching hats and scarves, inspired by an old Navy commercial. I kind of thought if they had matching hats and scarves on, no one would notice that they were so crazy. <laughs> um, but then when my mom showed up to dinner with like one glove that was different from the other and a hat that didn't match, it's like, well, I guess that didn't work. <laughs> Thanks, old Navy. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. Oh. Don't think ahead. <laughs> that year, um, my mom started spiraling and spiraling. And that didn't bother me so much. It's that my sister Sarah started spiraling and spiraling as well. It was sort of weird. And my older sister Rachel and I, like, we would make jokes about it. Like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Mom and Sarah are like, they're like gray gardens. But then, that's not that funny when you're talking about your family, right? We had the thought that maybe Sarah had also started taking some prescription drugs. But I wasn't really that sure about it. Um, but I called her on her birthday on November 13, 2009. And... I couldn't understand a word that she was saying. And she was slurring and pauses and and I definitely I definitely thought that something weird was going on. Um, and so I called up my oldest sister and my dad and I said, maybe I should ask Sarah to come live with me in Texas. And they said, Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and I, I didn't know how to approach the subject to her because it was kind of odd, but she was sort of receptive to it. She said, okay, I'm working on something right now, but how about in the new year? And I said, that sounds great. I didn't know what she meant, I'm working on something right now. But it sounded pretty positive to me. Um, I'm gonna go off on a tangent again. <laughs> so. As I kind of wrote all this, I, I realized there's a lot of things that I've learned about my family and Christmas and the lessons and blah, blah, blah. But none of them have been as influential on me as some of my favorite holiday movies. And so here are some of the most important lessons I've learned from holiday movies. Number one, if you see an empty Santa suit with a note about something or other, Walk away. You turn it on, you turn into Santa. I don't know, it seems awful. Christmas cheer can make Santa's sleigh operate, but only gas does that for your car. And I've tried this. <laughs> Christmas miracles are capable of making crippled kids walk, getting estranged couples back together, getting you a boyfriend, making old men to stop being dicks, finding you a husband, putting food on your table, and helping to make your dad turbo man. But there will always be that one Christmas light that's out that like knocks the whole strand out, right? <laughs> the US Postal Service may be a worthless organization, but they can prove the existence of Santa Claus. And that makes up for all lost packages in my book. <laughs> the only real reason you could possibly dislike Christmas is if your shoes are too tight. Or if your head is like slightly askewed, or you somehow have a smaller heart than necessary to survive. <laughs> or if you're Jewish and just eat. <laughs> Physical deformities can be useful to you, so you should let people take advantage. <laughs> and the last thing that I've learned, 
You absolutely, without any shadow of a doubt, will shoot your eye out. <laughs> All right, December 11th, 2009. I wake up with the worst hangover of all time. The night before, I went to three Christmas parties, I think, and it was just one. I'm sorry. It was just one of those nights where you are walking around and you're stopping in different places and you're drinking everywhere you go. And there's like all of this Christmas bark everywhere you Get it. Okay, I'm gonna just knock that out, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I think that I woke up the next morning and I was just like, either out. Jeez, I'm sorry. Okay, so I woke up the next morning and I'm like hungover, but I have to get up and go to work and it's like seven in the morning and uh, Okay. Now I'm gonna have to take this because this is my sister calling. I'm sorry. You're never gonna believe this. Okay, firstly, I don't know if I'm hung over or if I'm still drunk from the night before. I drank so much, I think if I got in my car right now, I would get pulled over and taken to jail. And P.S., mom has called me like three times, it's like 6.30 in the morning, and what? And why are you calling me right now? Abby, Sarah died. control of my appendages twice in my life. The first time, it was December 2000, and I was working at a <coughs> Mommy and Maiden Music School in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. Um, lots of rich moms, and they'd come in with their kids and like play recorder or something, but they would actually just send their Jamaican nannies in, and then they'd go do yoga. Um, and I had had very bad eczema for most of my life, and it usually got really bad in the winter. And I remember, it was like right before Christmas time, and I am just like covered in eczema, and I'm like scratching, and these moms are like giving me cards, and I'm like, there's blood coming out of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> You're a rich kid here. And, um, I didn't know what to do, so I thought, I was like, let me call my mom, maybe she's got an idea here. So I call her and she asked me if I have tried any Benadryl. And I haven't, I had never tried Benadryl before. Like, oh, Benadryl, does that work for eczema? And she was like, it's an antihistamine, it blocks histamines. Okay, so I said, oh, sure, I'll try some Benadryl. And she says, but Abby, take eight. <laughs> eight Benadryl? Doesn't that seem like kind of a lot? She's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Look, they're only 25 milligrams when you buy them over the counter, but the prescription Benadryl is 100 milligrams, so you should take eight. It's like, oh, all right, I guess you're absolutely correct about that. <laughs> down and notice that, no, not that the pen has stopped working. I, I'm not holding a pen. <laughs> and I actually am not even moving my arm anymore. And then upon further examination, I realized that I was actually lying face down on the floor <laughs> while a Jamaican nanny lightly kicked me in the head. <laughs> and I tried to get up and I literally had no control over my appendages. It was so weird, and they had to put me in a cab and send me home. That was the first time I lost <coughs> control of my appendages, and the second time was after I found out that my sister had died. 
I had to book a flight and I was trying to type and I couldn't literally pick my arms up. It was like I weighed 5,000 pounds. It's so bizarre. We found out later that my sister was indeed taking prescription drugs. Um, some that had been prescribed to her and some that she had gotten in other places. But she decided that she was addicted and wanted to stop. And so she went to an outpatient rehabilitation center. And they gave her this pill that was supposed to kind of like take the cravings away. And she took it that night and then she didn't wake up the next day. I got on a plane as fast as I could and I flew to Washington DC where my oldest sister Rachel lives. And I was greeted at the door by her two sons in their matching yarmulkes. <laughs> it was the first night of Hanukkah and I had not remembered. And I was watching them sort of at a distance, they're lighting the candles and opening their socks up. <laughs> and I just felt so bad for them. You know, they would just, they'd never know how badly Monica sucks. <laughs> as soon as we figured out what to do about my sister, I raced back to Houston. And I wanted to get back to my normal house, and my normal neighborhood with my normal big tree, and my normal job, and I went to work right away and I asked no one to say anything to me about it. And it was probably the worst Christmas I've ever had. I thought maybe that I should find religion. But I guess that's what people do when, when they lose someone, right? Um, but I didn't really know how. I had never had it in my life. And people kept saying to me, they've taken her to a better place. She's been taken to a better place. But I didn't get it. Like, wh who took her there? And why did they take her when we obviously needed her here? And in my defense, I've never been introduced to like Jesus or God or anything. I, I mean, I never believed in, in anything at all. Well, I mean, I guess I have believed in something, um, some sort of superpower. He's, he's jolly. Jolly <laughs> <laughs> uh, adult onset diabetes. <laughs> The only thing I have ever believed in in my entire life was Santa and Christmas. But Santa doesn't take things away. Santa gives. And that's, Santa doesn't take. That's like some weird other.
trying to come up with an ending to this piece because you know if this was a real Christmas special I would learn a valuable lesson or you know, <laughs> fall in love or I'd pay a homeless kid to buy me a prize turkey <laughs> How it is in real life, right? It's not, you don't get your Christmas miracles. But then I was thinking, maybe you do get your Christmas miracles. Maybe my Christmas miracle is that I can take my intense love of Christmas and my insane Jewish guilt and <laughs> shove it together and shove it down the throats of my own children. <laughs> All of my holiday issues on my own kids. And they will be so appreciative of it, I'm sure. And maybe, just maybe, we'll also celebrate a little bit of Hanukkah, like the menorah, <laughs> and that way, they will have the best of both worlds. Thank you so much. <laughs>